Before analyzing and improving, you want to have a good baseline of what your process, your product, and your problem are. That is the measure phase of the MAIC. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel. We talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And today's video, third in this sort of mini series on the MAIC, is about the measure phase. And what we want to do in the measure phase is to really get a good baseline and a good understanding of what is happening in the process. You know, we're probably looking for either an improvement in performance or more likely to remove all kinds of variations, different types of problems or unwanted effects that are happening. But we really need to know what the process does, right? How does it look? Now for that, in the measure phase, we don't really go into too much of the why and how type of things. That'll be the analyze phase that's coming up next. We want to have a very good baseline. But the thing we need to get to is to get to a level or maybe two or three deeper of information about your product, about your defect, about your process. And this is something we also call like a loss mode or defect mode. We'll get to that more in these bottom analysis thingies. But the tools that we use in the measure phase, they are all descriptive type of things, right? We're going to collect data. We're going to collect all kinds of facts about the process and the product and then put them into analysis tools, into graphs and visualizations in such a way that they make a lot more sense to us and that it's easier to understand, easier to communicate. Now, there are more tools than these, but these give you the idea of the type of, let's say the most important tools, but also the type of tools we use when measuring current performance, measuring the process, and that is a run chart. Now, we will get to an SPC chart, but that's in the control phase. See that this run chart, it doesn't have any control limits. And we didn't put specification limits in here either, but this just shows, you know, what is the process doing? What, what is our output doing in time? The really nice thing of a run chart is that it does not aggregate your data too much, right? These could be small sample groups, that's okay, but they are like one analysis, right? So an analysis of just one product or an analysis of four products and then the average, but we see how the process behaves over time. We can see if there is maybe a trend or if you know it's very spread or if it has seasonality or all kinds of things like that. Now, sometimes a run chart doesn't really give you any sort of useful information. Even in that case, it at least tells you that there are no observable trends, which too is super important to know. The next thing is looking at process capability. We can do the CMK and the CPK and the PPK and have a nice video on that specifically, you know what the difference is, but all of them, they are about process capability. They are checking, and here we do have the specifications, so these red lines here, they are the specifications. And this here distribution is the distribution of products coming out of the process, right? And we're gonna look at how capable is our process of producing within the specifications. And here we, we sort of took this whole run chart data and put it all together into one distribution. So this really is sort of a summary type of statistic. And in fact, the CPK will give you just one number. The number here uh, is going to be lower than one. It's not gonna be negative, luckily, because the average is still within the specifications, but you see that there's quite a bit already that is going out of specifications. And here we see, in this example, but that is sort of the things you can get from a CPK graph, is that this process is, well, could be capable, right? It does fit between the specifications, but it's not centered. So we're talking here about more of a centering problem, generally uh, easier to fix than when it is so wide that it goes over and the lower and the upper specification. So 
that sort of tells us the type of things that are happening in the process. Now these are very descriptive. What we also want is what I said, right? The loss mode type of thing, diving a little bit deeper. And uh, for that, for slicing the data that's to get to the loss mode, that's also just to see where strange things happen. We use a couple of tools like a Pareto, uh, a histogram, a box plot, and they split out what we see. The Pareto diagram is a very important one. You know we probably use it quite a bit. You've heard the Pareto principle with the 80-20 rule that is talked about a lot. What we do here is we split up, and this is basically only useful if you have a defect or a something that is happening, right? And then we split that up into the defect mode, so in those categories. And so we have scratched or damaged plates. This is a scratch on the left front. This is a scratch on the left back. This is a scratch in the middle, scratch on the right front, scratch on the right middle, scratch on the right back. And by looking at it in such a way, we say, oh, wait a minute. There's a couple of defect modes, a couple of ways that our problem presents itself that are way more prevalent. So we're going to focus on the top, right? And the traditional way to do this is to focus on that number of defects that together are going to give you 80% of the whole problem. Now, if you add these two together, you're probably indeed getting to 80% of the total. So you generally, when you do a Pareto analysis, you sort of select two, sometimes three of these sub-causes, unless, of course, there really is just the one problem mode that is absolutely overshadowing the rest. This gives you mountains of information. Because even, even if it is more flat, then you know that scratches happen everywhere in this example. And that also means that we're not looking at one specific station that is making some damage, but it must be a completely different thing that is happening. Maybe your plates are sliding somewhere, maybe something falls down, all kinds of things, but it's not a fixed station that always does a manipulation on the top left side. With this, we know oh, these have quite specific ways that the problem presents itself. So, a Pareto diagram. The histogram, it looks a lot like this CPK diagram, right? So, what we do in a histogram is we combine what we see happening with what a normal distribution should be doing. That is the typical way to look at a histogram. First off, you just make that the distribution as it is. See, these here, they are all categories. They might be, you know, 10 kilos, 11, 12, 13, 14, all the way up to 18 kilos of the product. And we see that there, you know, our product is roughly 15 kilos and there is a bit of split. Now, if your process has some normal variation in it, you would expect that this behaves like a normal distribution. Sometimes you see that it is completely uniform. It's also a type of distribution. Sometimes it's very nicely skewed, another type of distribution. But usually you sort of expect it to be a normal distribution. If you then draw that normal curve in here, and you go and look a bit and say, oh, well, that, that's sort of okay. That, hey, wait a minute. We have a couple of light products that occur way more often than we would have expected in a normal distribution. So we sort of tentatively conclude that there is a secondary process happening. But maybe we are, and I had this in a cutting business uh, where you start cutting the product into small slices and then at the end there's something's left. Right? The, the bars were not all exactly the same length. The cut was made at a nice exact interval and then the last piece, well, whatever was left. right? So we got quite a number of light products out of that. Now, in that case we knew it was in the process and we sort of just took 
care of it that it did not end up in the data and also not in the process control because it was giving problems. But you see such type of behavior very well with a histogram. If the bars that you draw don't really look like a normal distribution and the normal distribution, you simply calculate, you can use Excel for that, take all of the data that you have and just ask Excel to give you an average and a standard deviation. Those two you then put back into making that nice little graph. Now, statistical software packages can do this more automated. And then you just check hey, which ones are not complying with it and what type of distribution do we have. Super useful to draw. I would recommend, well, honestly, I would recommend doing all of them, but a histogram, really one of your major tools, the no, first type of tools to go for, run chart, histogram. Now, a box plot that is slightly different. This is a comparison tool. So here, again, we, we slice the data in a certain way, but a bit like the Pareto, but in a box plot, we don't slice it on the defect mode or something like that. We definitely don't just slice it into categories like a histogram, but we put it into sort of a factor that we think contributes. So for instance, we might want to group all of our data into, we have four shifts in the factory. And shift A, B, C, and D, they have produced these products. Now, how does a box plot work? It is sort of this histogram on the side, so it looks a bit like this. And within the box, 50% of our values is in there, 50% of the products produced. The whiskers also have 25 and 25 percent of everything that was produced. So the whole thing is everything you produced. The box is the middle 50%. The dash is the, the median, like the most, it's not the most average product, but the, the one that was really in the middle. And the main thing here, you know, again, Excel can make this, any statistical package uh, worth its salt should also be able to make this. What you look for is for boxes that are really outside of the other boxes. So here we see, and it, even the lower side of its own box is almost higher than the higher side of all of the other boxes. That is a statistically different, significantly different process happening there. So here, when the boxes sort of overlap, you know, the averages will be slightly different, but eh, they are almost the same. But team C, they have a completely different thing. This can also be lines, day or night shape, day of the week. You, know, you can split a bit. What I see quite often is that people make a bar chart, sort of like a histogram, that is a bar chart of the averages of the categories. And so you make four bars with the average weight of the product per shift. And then one of the bars is a bit higher, and you say, okay, that's the one. The thing is, in such a graph, you cannot see the spread. Right? So if those boxes would be quite a bit wider, then the process with a lot of variation, then even it dipping up is not really a significant difference. Making it into a box plot tells you so much more, but it is a difficult chart for people to, to read for the first time. So you will have to help them, but a super good way to split categories. Now, this is what you do in the measurement phase. So you just look at what the process does. You check, is it capable to produce within specs? What is the problem we're having? Are we going on one side over specs, on the other, on both? And then you, you slice, right? You slice into the problem by seeing which of the modes is the most prevalent how it actually behaves more on its own continuous scale. Histograms are uh, pretty useless if you are gonna compare modes. This has to be one scale of the same thing happening more or less. And this doesn't have to be the problem, right? In our example of weight, weight is not a problem. It is deviation from weight. And box plots or similar tools we use to split in probable cause categories. And that will set us up to really go into the 
analysis phase, the next phase in our DMAIC. Now, if you want to be sure that you can measure properly so that you get the correct data, that you know what the variation is that also your measurement system is giving on top of your product, and just have a good objective tool to make sure that you can trust your measurement system, check out my course on Gauge R&R, a really good system, industry standard, for assessing the quality of your measurement. So use that to make sure you get good data input so that you can use this measure phase tools and understand what your process is doing. Now, I hope you liked that video. Don't forget to hit that like button and I will see you in the analyze phase.